We're turning to the second epistle of Timothy, and I want you to open your Bible at the third chapter, and we'll not be moving from that place tonight. Second Timothy chapter 3. We must always make sure we have the context so that we can make real sense of what has been said here. This is the final will and testament of the great Apostle Paul. He's incarcerated in the notorious Mamorine prison in Rome. It was just a hole in the ground, filthy, rat-infested place. This is the third and final time that he has been to prison, but all the other prisons were, we would say, Mickey Mouse compared to this last one that he's in. They say that he may be chained to a dead Roman soldier, any food he gets is dropped through a hatch. And with bad eyesight, he scrolls this last letter, or maybe just one of his last letters, to his young son in the faith, Timothy. Now, Timothy's wobbling. Many of us wobble in the faith. Timothy's getting it tight. And he's questioning the faith even. And if you study young Timothy, you will know that he had a physical, he had a mental, and he had spiritual problems. And it's no wonder. Because they're under the fierce persecution of the Emperor Nero. He was burning the Christians wholesale, letting the lions loose on them, and crucifying. They reckon in a year after, at least a year after this, the Apostle Paul went and was beheaded in Rome. And he could say in the next chapter, I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. And then he said, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, not only for me, but for all those, and remember here's some of his last words now, for all those who love his appearing. The last words of the apostle were about the Lord coming back again. The last words of our Lord Jesus was about him coming back again. The last words of Daniel was about him coming back again. And you go through the scriptures and you'll discover in the prophetic scriptures, Zechariah, all speaking at the end of their days that the king is coming and he's coming and you make no mistake about that and if you're not ready tonight you would need to get ready before you leave this place and if you're a backslider tonight you'd need to get back to God as fast as you can even before the meeting's over and get right with God. It's in this context that the Apostle Paul writes these verses in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let us read just the first nine verses. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now understand that the Greek, that is, will come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. And there's 19 things here if you care to count them carefully. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, without natural affection, as the abortionists, and the homosexuals, Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, 
despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now here's the key verse. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. I may be wrong in saying this, but I think this is the only time you'll get this phrase, certainly from the Apostle Paul, from such, turn away. For of this sort, and I want you to draw your mind to that phrase, for this, for of this sort, they which creep into houses and lead captive silly or weak women laden with sins, led away with divers' lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. And the Lord will bless the reading of his word. Just a wee moment's prayer, please. Father, we thank thee for what has been prayed. We thank you for what we've been singing. And Lord, we come now to hear your word, Lord, and as has also been prayed, Lord, O oh God, still our hearts. These are solemn meetings and solemn days. Lord, speak to us and help us to understand your word tonight. For Jesus' sake, amen. If I were asked to give you one word which sums up these Sunday night meetings that we have been conducting, it would be the word in verse 1, times. Times. We, we have been dealing with the times that we find ourselves in both presently and prophetically according to the word of the Lord. And then in the verse 1, you have another word, and it's the word days. And that word days is the word eschatos, where we get the word eschatology from, which means the end times, the last days. The days of the termination of grace. The days when the Spirit of Christ and the spirit of the church has ended. The last days of time. And then there's another word here. Paul says no. This no. That in the last days perilous times shall come. Now that word no is absolutely certain. There is no doubt whatsoever this dying man says about what you're going to hear tonight. He's not saying, I think, or I hope, or maybe. No, he's, he, he's absolutely categorically clear that these last days of the church age will be the days that he describes here in this portion of Scripture. He says there will be perilous times. And I'll tell you in a moment what perilous times are, and you will be able to identify them very well with the hour in which we live. Now, I want you to make, get this clear into your mind. He's not talking here about the tribulation period. He's not talking about what happens after the church goes. Nor is he talking about the terrible days that there has been down to these days. For instance, the Inquisition of Rome 
the Crusaders in the Middle Ages and even Reformation time. He's specifically speaking here about these days in which we are in tonight, the Laodicean period of the church the period before the great evacuation of every blood-bought saint from this earth, which could happen at any moment, no prophecies to be fulfilled before the Lord comes to take his church away. Laodicea was the last of the seven churches that the risen Lord spoke to in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3. And I want you to notice this very carefully because it sets a context for a meeting. The most of the other six churches he writes to, or he sends to John from the glory, he says this, unto the church in Smyrna, unto the church in Pergamos, unto the church in Philadelphia, in Thyatira, in Sardis. But when he comes to Laodicean, he says this, unto the church of Laodicea. Now that tells me that he has withdrawn from the Laodicean church. He no longer owns the Laodicean church, this last church these days in which we live in the West. Because we know that from Revelation 3, because it's in that context. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He is outside of the church. You see, the word Laodicea means the people's rights. The word Laodicea means the people's own judgment. They ran the church in Laodicea with democracy. Voted and ballots, and they got together and they said what they thought would be a good thing to do. And when you get boys talking, I mean, I think it would be good. It doesn't matter what they think, it's what God says. That's what matters. And the church is not run by democracy, nor is the, ch- nor is the church run by autocracy, one man or two men. It's run by theocracy, God. God. And it's from God we need to hear. It's the voice of God through the Word of God that we need to hear and how to run and manage the affairs of the church. Not from men, but from God. Is it any wonder that they were miserable, wretched, poor, and blind, lukewarm, nauseating, where the Son of God says, I will spew you out. I'll vomit you up out of my mouth. Boys, he couldn't increase with goods and have need of nothing. There are many places. I'm sad to say it's like that tonight. They have a form of godliness, but no power, no fire, no authority, tepid, lukewarm, And God, the Lord, can't handle. He'd rather have a man cold or hot. He'd rather have an unsaved man than a carnal man. You see, they had a form, they had a facade. Uh, They had a resemblance of godliness. They might have looked the part, talked the part, sing the part. I come to the conclusion the other day that these Laodicean Christians had only half obeyed the Word of God. Now you say, what do you mean only half the, the Word of God? I tell you what I mean. John the Baptist came preaching repentance and the baptism of water unto repentance. But then John the Baptist says, but he that cometh after me he that cometh after me comes bapt- and preaching the baptism of the Holy Ghost and of fire. They were saturated in water. They were saturated in the Word. They were saturated in the truth. They had the table, the tank, and the truth. But they had no power. They had no fire. 
And there's so many churches like that, and we heard that the other Sunday from our young brother here regarding the altar and the fire. Nothing, only ashes. And these people are like this, and there's so many around our country tonight, and they're baptized in the immersion. And, and they know the scriptures inside out, and they break bread. But they've never went on through into the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire and power. Hence, we have a Laodicean church. And let me tell you, when you put these 19 types into a barrel and mix them up, you have some dose. You have a very dangerous society when you study the 19 people that God Paul's talking about here in the last days. And I tell you, when they're let loose on the society, and I tell you, when they're in a church, they're unbridled, they're unfettered, they're ungovernable, they're unteachable, they're a cage of every unclean bird, self-lovers, covetous, proud, boasters, bossy, lovers of selves, sodomites, apostates. I tell you there's some difference in them than the ones in, we're supposed to be in Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit. Hallelujah. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, long-suffering, faith. That's the other side. One side to the other side. I'm glad I'm on this side tonight. Glad I am. There's only one place in the New Testament where this word perilous is found. Now these are the days that we're in tonight. There's only one other place that is found in the 8th chapter of Matthew when the two demonic... The two demonics were... Untamable. It says they were exceedingly fierce. That's the word perilous. They were so exceedingly fierce that no man could pass them by. They were naked and roaring and cutting themselves. What a picture of many of the youth today across our land. Another picture of it is the sea raging and roaring or a lion or a bear let loose on the rampage, mauling all before it. That's what the word perilous means. And Ronald A. Ward, in his commentary on First and Second Timothy, adds to that, and he says, also it means pressurized with much stress. Boy, that's a familiar word, isn't it? Pressurized with much stress. Like the sea roaring, like a wild animal. Like men on the streets, you're afraid to pass by. Oh, I tell you, Paul was writing the word that God gave him, let me tell you. And these are his last, among his last words. And we would need to take heed because it's going to get worse and worse and worse as the end approaches. This is a wit's end corner scenario. Jesus says that. He says in the last days, men's hearts will fail them because of fear. Like the waves of the sea roaring and raging, tsunamis and cyclones and tornadoes. They're everywhere around us, my friend. And how concerned are we here, here, listen, are you in your sin still tonight? Huh? Have you never been to Jesus for the cleansing power in Northern Ireland when the gospel has been preached on every corner and every opportunity you've got and brought up in a Christian home and you're on your way to hell and you'll deserve it? You'll deserve it. You take heed tonight. In case you'd end up in this awful place called hell. This is a wit's end corner scenario. You know, there's a lot of churches now in the USA and in Britain, and they're employing full-time psychiatrists. And they've also armed guards in the churches and some outside the churches. Now, and I'm not saying tonight that no one 
hasn't mental problems, a lot of mental problems, a lot of depression, there's oppression, I'm not saying that. But I am, what I am saying is this. The problem is not in the mind. The problem is in the heart. It's out of the heart comes these things. And it's the heart that needs to be dealt with. And psychiatrists will not deal with the sin problem. They'll not deal with the heart problem. Are you telling me that if someone in this meeting tonight comes to see me afterwards and they tell me that they're burdened with conviction and they're not sleeping and they're hearing voices and they're depressed and they're dis oppressed, do you tell me this is a psychiatrist that they need? No, no, first and foremost, they need the Lord. That's what they need. They need deliverance. And maybe you're here tonight and you've been everywhere trying everything to get deliverance from drugs or drink or pornography or something else. But the Lord is able to deliver you tonight. He is able to deliver. And make no mistake about that. I tell you, if there ever was a case for a psychiatrist, it was the boy from Gedara. Naked. Roaring, cutting himself night and day. Imagine cutting himself night and day. The boy going out of a meeting, the one that rolled up his sleeve to me one time in the tent bay meeting, he rolled up the sleeve, look at this, and then he showed me all the slashes. That's what I want to see them for. But here's a boy who's cutting himself night and day in the tombs, naked. They put the heavy chains around them and they snapped them like daisy chains. They couldn't handle them. The authorities couldn't handle them. That's why they put them away out into the barren Gadara. Can you hear somebody say, oh, get the police. We need to section this boy. We need to get an injection into him. It's not something they needed to get into him. It's something they needed to get out of him. Come out of the man, Jesus says, thy own clean spirit, and out he came. And if you will allow him to do that tonight, if you're humble enough tonight, and broken enough tonight, and desperate enough tonight, and you go into that room behind there and you say, Lord, I'm tired of all this old voices, and I'm tired of the devil, and I'm tired of drink, and I'm tired of drugs, then he'll deliver you. Or else he'll not keep his word. He'll deliver you. He is able to deliver you. It's not a doctor this fellow wanted. It's not a psychiatrist, not a police. He wanted the Lord, and the Lord delivered him and set him free and turned him out to be a mighty evangelist. I can hear somebody saying, Quick, you may come outside Jericho here, the wee boy that's in charge of the inland revenue is going mad. He's running through the crowds back and forward and he has climbed up into a sycamore tree. We need to get a helicopter to take him down. I'd have got him down. I'd have starved him down. What was the problem with this fellow? It wasn't in his mind. It was money. <laughs> that was the problem. He was fiddling and conjuring and stealing money. That he had to put right and get, oh, it's all right. Oh, I'm not well. I'm depressed. We're all depressed. And I'm not running down depression. We're all depressed. And we can be all depressed if we want to be depressed. Oh, get this fella down. This wee man's down. He's, he's going mad. He's duking in. He's looking out through the, these trees. You get him up. I, 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 I got him down all right. It's not the problem with his mind at all. It's the problem with money. When Jesus says, come down, he came down and sorted the money problem out. Have you a money problem tonight? <laughs> and Lord might he'll not pay your bills for you. You won't pay them yourself. Maybe if you'd go and pay them, you'd be able to see a bit of blessing. Oh, no. 
Here's another one. Hey, hey, quick, come to the Saker's well. There's a woman here at midday. A woman shouldn't be about here at midday. The sun's too hot. She's running around the well with a bucket. She's going to commit suicide. Her trouble, her trouble's not mine. Her trouble was man. She was married five times. My friend, the point that I'm trying to make tonight, we need to get to the kernel of the problem. And that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. He knew the heart. We can have all these facades and we can put on this and that and the other thing. But listen, friend, we need to get to the heart of the problem. And the heart of the problem is sin that needs to be repented of and confessed and fled from. And he'll do it. He'll do it if we, if, if we let him do it. But if you don't let him do it, he'll not do it. Now, Paul didn't say to young Timothy here, Timothy, you're stressed and you're agitated and, and you're fearful. Oh, oh, so, oh, my son, Timothy, you need the doctor. No, here's what he said to him. He said, Timothy, God has not given us the spirit of fear. He hasn't given us a fearful spirit, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. And then he says this to him, he says, Paul, hold fast to the sound words that you heard of me and be not ashamed of the testimony of Christ. Endure hardness as a good soldier. Listen, Timothy, we're in a battle. You're taking over from me. I am going. My mantle's coming on you. We're in a battle and we need to fight. Not run, not duke. We need to fight. And then he said to him, listen, Timothy, endure hardness as a good soldier. If we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Flee youthful lusts and follow righteousness, faith and love and peace. And then he says, store up the gift that is in you. Rake out the ashes. Pull the sacrifice back onto the altar and cry for the fire to fall. That's what Timothy needed. Timothy needed the wee wine for the stomach's sake. We need a wee bit of medicine at times. I'm not saying anything about medicine. Be it he, he, mentally and spiritually, he was hammered down with all that was going on around him, just like some of you mothers and some of you fathers with the family, with the work, with the money, with the husband, with the wife, with all these things that are going on. Listen, it's real. It's real. And we all know that it's real. But he stir up that gift man, get back into the battle, get back into the prayer meeting, get back into the fight. Don't give up and don't give in and don't give out. Keep going, keep going. Hallelujah. That's been the matter here for 36 years. Keep going. We've kept going. Glory to God. We'll keep going too. Now, here's the punchline. We're going to close with verse 6. Look at verse 6. I can't, it'll take me a night to go through every one of these. That'll be 19 nights and I'll be dead before that. But we're going to take one tonight. Because there's some, it's, look, look at what it says. For this sort, now that's some of these 19 sorts. Well, that's what it says, that's the way I read it. For this sort, are they which creep into houses. Houses. I want you to hold that in your mind. Some of these 19. These lictors of all sorts. I was going to call them Bertie Basses, but I wouldn't want to put my name near them. You wouldn't want too many of these boys in your house. <laughs> you, you go through the list of them again. Would you want them in your house? Well, Paul says here they're, they're going into houses. Look at that. Look at like I want you to let this sink in. Now. For of this sort are they which creep, which creep into houses. Do you know what this is and what I'm closing with tonight? Pure rank apostasy. 
a form of godliness, turning away from the truth. And you're going to see that here, just right here. You see it, you see it in the verse. For of this sort, they which creep into houses and lead captive, silly women, laden with sin and lusts. Verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power. You see that word denying? Rejecting and forsaking and refusing the power of God. Denying the power. Now, when someone denies the power, what are they denying? They're denying the gospel. For the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. They're denying the blood. Because the blood, the power is in the blood. And they're denying not only the gospel, and they're not only denying the blood, but they're denying the Holy Spirit. That sort of now is this. This is the sort that's creeping into houses. Creeping into houses. That word creep, here's what it means. Sneak. Slip. Like a snake. And worm their way into the houses. And wrap themselves round their victims. It's the devil. It's the snake. This is the crowd, Paul says, from such. Turn away. And if you're in one of these houses or churches, because it not only refers to the house of God, it refers to the domestic house. And I'm going to explain that now. They creep in, they worm their way in, under the guise of Christianity. They have a form of godliness. But they deny the power thereof. That's the devil. You can see him there in the serpent. And you can also see him there. He's taking the women. It says that in the text. Weak women. And I'm not talking about the Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons who come in the mornings and in the afternoon when the man of the house may be away working. That's what they do. And they come into some young housewife or some woman that's in a bit of trouble and the marriage and things are not going well and, and they come in with a lovely wee phrase and lovely wee coatings of Scripture and everything else to them. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about apostates, those who once knew the truth, once who lived the truth, some of them, and they've turned away from the truth. These are the marks of the last day in which we live. Those who profess to be Christians, attacking the vulnerable, People like Timothy who is defeated and who is down and who is depressed and who is under fierce pressure. They slip in. They creep in. They worm their way in under the plazas of Christianity. And they might read Psalm 23. And they might quote Romans 8 and 28. For all things work together for good. And they're lovely. Oh, no, he was a lovely man. Lovely wee words with him. He's caring. No, boy doesn't care much about He's caring and he's lovely. And they, they come in again to the weak and they take them captive. And if you want to look at the last verse of chapter 2, Paul prepared us for this, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Do you see how Paul in his last days is talking about the enemy? Do you see how he's talking about the, uh, the, the devil and the, just at the verge of the coming of the Lord again in the last days? He's warning us of the enemy. My friend, we need to be careful of the spirits of the enemy that's abroad today. 
That's why we need to know our Bible and be saturated in the Scripture. That's why we need to maintain and keep our family altar that when these boys slip in, that we're able to handle them. And so many of God's people are not able to handle them because so many of God's people, you know what they're doing? They're getting a wee daily reading and they're getting down five minutes before they go out to work and they're reading a wee daily reading and they're mumbling a wee prayer and you might as well talk to the man in the war memorial. My friend, unless we are grounded in the Word and saturated in the Word and understand the Word, I had them at my door the other day. And unless we are saturated in the Word and know the Word and know what they're at and ask them what they're doing and clear, get them away from about you, turn away from them. But here we have, here we have them, we making the way into these dear women. And that's very powerful what Paul says, silly women or weak women. Maybe mothers distressed and burdened. As I say, their marriage may be a bit rocky and finances are not good and the children are giving them trouble. And these apostates, these people come in and hear what they say. And I'm talking from experience now. Do you know, do you know what your problem is, dear? It's that church you're going to. That church. We used to go to a church like that too. These boys, these boys talking about full surrender. These boys talking about all on the altar stuff. These boys telling us what you can wear. Are you baptized? Are you saved? Oh, I'm saved. Are you baptized? I'm saved. Well, that's all you need now. You're, you're dead on. These boys to tell you what Bible to use. Tell you what sort of clothes to wear. Tell you when you can speak and when you can't speak. That's your problem. Your problem, that's, that's tripe they're talking. You're in bondage. That's the word now they're using. Bondage. And I want to tell you from experience, after 36 years here, that we have lost many families because of this. Many families. And I can tell you this morning, I can tell you today, where many of them are, nowhere. Oh, that old life about hats and women can't talk at the table and all this sort of this full surrendered life. You're, you, we, we, we're saved and, 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 and we're baptized and so that's all that we need. Don't you listen, don't you, don't you, they're saying, don't, don't you go back near that place. That, you, you need liberty, you need freedom. You need to get into a place where you can sing and praise and talk in tongues and enjoy yourself. That's what the apostates are at. And they say, we used to be in those places too, but we have started a new church now. You know what Paul calls the new church? The CIE. We have started a new church up the road and sometimes we meet in our houses and, and we sing and we praise and, and we give a wee ten minute word and, and we can come and dress as we like and we can bring our partners, let them be men or women if we like. We can do whatever we like and, and, and the children are always lovely. There's the wee children's story and all and everything there. But what Paul calls them the CIE, the church of the itchy ears in the next chapter. Tickle their ears. And because they're not grounded in the Word and they're not in the Word, they're meat for anything. And I can tell you from experience, from my heart, that we could have lost a dozen families, maybe more over the years from this church for this very reason, for they've come and told me. And if they haven't told me, they've told others where we were at. We can't be under this restriction. We can't be under this bondage. We can't be told these things. We need freedom. We need liberty. And we have found it now. And praise the Lord. We're praising the Lord all day. And we're enjoying the children. Love it. But I want to tell you, my friend, and I know three or four families that have been in three or four different places from the left here. Do you know where some of them were this morning in the supermarket? Do you know where they are the night? They're sitting in front of the television and even worse, and they go nowhere. 
And I could tell you, but I wouldn't do that. You see, there's a whole attack on these days against fundamentalism. There's all fundamentalism they call it. Oh, this old, this old fundamentalism and all this sort of stuff. You need freedom. You need liberty. Well, I want to tell you, my friend, that that's not what this, these women in this house needed. And I'm going to close by telling you that's not what they needed. Look at the text again. For of this sort they which creep into the houses and lead captive weak women laden with sins and divers lusts. Here's women with problems. They're burdened with sin. Maybe, maybe some of them had an affair. Don't be taking the sin and the burden out of this now. Maybe some of them had an affair. Maybe some of them had an abortion. Maybe some of them had stole. And let me tell you, I've dealt with all three here types of people. Maybe, maybe they stole something and maybe they would aborted a child and maybe they had an affair and they're, they're burdened down. My friend, singing will not cure that. Courses will not cure that. A new preacher will not cure that. These people need to be dealt with by faithful preachers from the Word of God. It's not Psalm 23, the need is Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God. It's not Romans 8 and 28, it's Romans 1 and 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Repent. Oh, that's hard preaching on these dear people. No, no. That's the cure. My friend, that's the cure. And that's what Paul's telling us here. Now, I'm, I'm preaching on last days, and this is the last days. And this is what is going on all around us tonight. These apostates with a form of godliness. With no cross, no blood, no gospel. There's no use in telling this reading Psalm 23 to this one. It's far deeper than that, my friend. A faithful man of God needs to sit down with this woman and explain to her, listen, you have a problem, but God can deal with your problem. You need, you need to confess and repent. Don't try to cover it over with courses or a new church. It'll not do it. It'll still be there when you're done. You remember Achan? Achan was from the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah was the tribe of praise. And Duken, Achan stole the Babylonian garments and he brought them home to the tent and he buried them underneath the tent. And if there were the tribe of praise, then Judah and his people would have been praising and thanking the Lord and thanking the Lord. But there was a problem Joshua says there's a problem. There's something wrong. We're after losing, was it, 38 men or so many men there in the battle. And you go down before God, God, what's wrong that we're losing men in the battle? He says there's sin in the camp. And you go down and they started to pray and God said, get up and stop praying and set the house in order and get things right. Aiken's the problem. And they had to go to Aiken's home and they had to tear back the old canvas and they had to go down and take the stuff that he stole. Praising didn't do that, my friend. And I love to praise the Lord, although I can't sing, but I do, and I love to hear the praise here and the singing here. But we must be real and we must be faithful and we must be truthful when we're meeting with some dear woman or some dear man and they're burdened down with sins. We need to tell them the truth. We need to tell them they have to repent. We need to tell them they have to come to Christ. We need to tell them that there's no burden too heavy that God can't bear. We need to tell them that Jesus loves them. We need to tell them that Jesus died on the cross for them. 
We need to tell them that there's real liberty and there's real freedom and there's real peace and there's real joy and there's real happiness. <laughs> Glory to God there is, for I found it. And I tell you, there'll be no use in coming to me and telling me, reading me Psalm 23. It wasn't Psalm 23 I needed. I needed to see my sin. I needed to see where I was. In the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son cleanses us from all sin. And we have to tell these people the truth. Here's the apostates now. They've weaved their way in. And they haven't time to go in. They've weaved their way into the house of God. Of course, they've slipped in. Jude says the, the word in Jude is they slipped in the back door. And they'll slip in the back door and they'll slip into the, into the pew and they'll take part and they'll sing and they'll maybe be deacons and they'll maybe be elders, but at the bottom of it all, the devils want to destroy the work. And if ever we needed to guard the pulpit, we need to guard this one. If ever we needed to take our stand, we need to take our stand. If ever we needed to be faithful to the Lord, we need to be faithful to the Lord. And if these are my last words, I'll be glad. I'll be glad that they're my last words, that we must stand for the old truth of the gospel. We must preach the gospel with power and with clarity and with authority. We must never deny the blood. We must never be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We must never care whether people leave or whether they don't leave, that we stand for the old fundamental truths of God's Word. And as long as there's breath in my body, I will do it. Glory to God. Do you know why I'll do it? Because it works. It works. I've seen it work. I've seen it work. Now, if you're here tonight and you're depressed and you're down, don't think I'm your enemy. I am not. If you're here tonight and you're burdened down with sins and problems and trials, and you know very well that medication is good and you need it. I'm not saying you don't, but it'll not cure you. And you try one thing and you try another thing and you go to one man and you go to another man and like the woman that touched the hem of his garment, you're worse than when you began. But you need to come to Jesus. And that's my plea to you tonight as a close. We've only dealt with one, maybe go back next week and dealt with another of these because these are the last time people that are this, this sort. Of course, you have the Sodomites here. And boy, they're well into the houses. <laughs> we could take a night on them. The last days. The last times. I'm going to die, Paul says. I want to leave you with this. Watch the devil. Watch those that have a form of godliness and they're lovely people and they'll sing and they'll have a Bible and they'll have all the rest, but they'll deny. Deny the blood, the cross, the Holy Spirit, the atonement, justification, substitution. To deny the cross. You know what Paul says? He says in Philippines, he says, I tell you weeping that they're enemies of the cross work of Christ. Oh, glory to God. Let us never be ashamed of him. Let us never turn away from him. But let us turn away from them that deny him. For there he hung there he was hammered with the thorns, hammered down in his brow. There he was on his back like a ploughed field and his tongue clave to the roof of his mouth and every bone in his body at a joint. There he was, dying the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. My friend, if he can't cleanse you and save you and deliver you and set you free, nobody else can but he can and he will if you will let him talk to us tonight. We're not going to pray afterwards tonight. We're going to give it wee time again tonight to talk to one another and talk and tell somebody what your problems are and we'll pray with you. We'll help you. We'll do all that we can to come to Christ.
Let us pray.